I've been waiting for patch 4.2 to drop and it is finally here so it is time to finally do the Cathay tier list with the complete roster, new and old units included. So I'm quite proud of the tier list we do here. We walk through from tier 1 to tier 5 to show the journey of your campaign from the beginning to the end and we rank the units in a bit of an unusual way. This has nothing to do with spam ability. Some units are naturally just support units. You only want 1, 2, maybe 3 at most but this does not disqualify them from the legendary status and similarly there might be units that aren't that great that are very convenient and they will find your way into your army despite not being ranked that high on this list and the first change you will see is there is no more overpowered tier Creative Assembly have overall done an excellent job of balancing the game at least on the campaign level. So walking through the tiers, from the very top we have the S tier which is legendary. These units stand well above the rest and they are something you should employ in every single campaign at some point. The flavour of this game is the uniqueness, the strengths and the weaknesses of all the different races which is what makes them interesting to play, having to circumvent your weaknesses through your strengths. As such every race should have at least a couple of legendary tier units that help to find the race. Now Excellent is just a tier below that and this is the cream of the crop still. Very strong, very useful at multiple stages of the game. Strong, flexible and well worth its investment. Down to B tier solid, this is still a very good unit. This unit can still more than deliver and may be the answer for particular niche problems you'll come up against. Now C usable, it's not a dirty word. You can still use this and it will not compromise your campaign but you are overlooking potentially some of the better options should they they be available. D is outperformed. Straight up either too expensive, too inconvenient or just outclassed by better options and the E tier is banished and this is a unit that either needs retweaking so it fills a niche or is just really that bad. If the game is balanced well there should be the majority of units between A, B tier, a couple in C and only a few in S and D tier to demonstrate the faction is well balanced internally. Now we can't rate battlefield units without talking about battlefield harmony. Units are either yin or yang. It's oversimplified but think of yin units as range units and yang units as melee. Individually they operate the same but if a yin unit is in range of a yang unit that unit is fulfilled, balanced and gains the harmony bonus. This yin range unit will gain extra reload speed and leadership and similarly the yang unit will gain bonus to its melee skills. Harmony is a static bonus so it doesn't stack but you only need part of the unit within range of the circle and every model in that unit will gain the harmony bonus. The harmony bonus is excellent for getting low level units to punch up way higher and high tier units to do even better. Just a quick reminder guys, if you are enjoying the video, please consider liking and subscribing. It really helps out. Ask any question in the comments. I answer everything. And if you'd like to talk strategy, feel free to join the Discord. Cheers. Now, whilst this isn't a recruitable unit, I think it's absolutely worth putting here because it is something you should use if not aware. Have your Wujing Compass set to the Great Bastion and you can summon the Ancestral Warriors once a battle. And they don't last very long, but they don't need to. They bring anti-large and armor piercing, which is exceptional useful in the early game to help take down a large enemy unit but the most devious use of this is to summon in front of any unit that's about to engage with your army pinning them in place taking some damage and allowing your archers even more time to work. The Grand Bastion is an excellent first stop for your Wujing Compass and so long as the battle is in your own territory you can summon these ancestral heroes. Now moving to the most basic bread and butter units of your early game, the Peasant Units, the Peasant Archer and the Peasant Spearman. On their own they're not that special but given the Harmony bonus gives plus 4 to the melee stats and a plus 10 increase to reload speed, they can perform surprisingly well. Given that Cathay essentially specialises in producing heavy heavily armoured units, you will always have a defendable frontline. This means in an emergency you can hire more heavily armoured frontline troops and there's mass produced basic peasant archers to give you the ranged edge. Now the downside of them is they've got basically no armour piercing and they don't do very good damage at all. You can increase their power through the tech tree but you can say the same for anything. Now in the original cut of the game I would have put these up at B tier but changes in technologies and for other reasons you'll see they're replaced 
placement is just so much better in the patch 4.2 that this is where they now belong. See usable, but you will find yourself recruiting these are plenty in your campaign and they are still a pretty damn good unit. Talking about the spears, they are also a very easy to underrate unit. They have expert charge defense, so not just horses, they can flip back the charges on anything. Sure, yes, you will want Jade Warriors with 80 armor holding that front line, but having a couple of these in the rear of your army is not a bad idea because their spears will gouge through enemy cav that would dare envelop you. Do not be surprised in your campaign if you need to hire some Jade Warriors in a pinch and globally recruit some peasant archers, and don't forget a couple of peasant spears in the back will help deal with the unique scenarios and lower your upkeep. The final peasant unit on a horse and unfortunately it is outperformed. And the simple reason is this, I think the reason why peasants are easy to overrate is because you only usually fight peasants. Notice in Yuan Bo's campaign, you'll find they're nowhere near as effective when they have to fight skinks, saurus, warriors and other troop types. Cathay are a defensive faction that want to gain that yin yang bonus. Now I'm a big advocate for a single unit of cav being able to win battles you might otherwise lose, flanking around the enemy and disrupting their ranged units. And this unit can achieve that, but before you know it, it'll be charging into fights that it can't finish. Honestly, the only time you'd see me hire these is if I could only get peasant spears and archers and would need a bit more reach. Now moving up to a unit that's even better in the latest patch, the Mighty Jade Warrior. Yes, sure, this isn't the most elite trained infantry in the world, but Cathayans are famous for being able to mass produce high quality armor and outfit a ton of troops better than they have any right to. Like most of the Cathayan units, they can dig in, increasing their armor and staying power the longer they hold still in formation. When you're a soldier in a Cathayan unit, you don't join a formation, you are the formation. There is no need to look left and right, you have been told to stay still, to move when you're told, and everything is under strict discipline and command. Each man understands he is one piece of a greater puzzle that is to be positioned into victory. 80 armor and blocking a third of all the missiles that come in on a tier 1 unit is just absolutely insane. You want them in front of rage units and then they get even better because of the Yang Harmony bonus. They don't have anti-large to rapidly take down horses, but they're there to hold the line and damn, they do a good job of it. But if your Jade Warriors do want anti-large, it's alright they come with a Halberd variant as well. Now there's a lot of argument to put these guys in A tier excellent, but here's the deal, you don't need a lot of anti-large early on, and you're about to see gunpowder is a far more effective way to strip the enemy of their armor than the Halberds. Now th this is a pretty good unit, if you have a two-handed weapon and no shield, you need some armor and some good HP on those bodies to absorb the damage. And they effectively have it here. Their problem is their equipment is invested in late high tier threats, which you're not going to fight. And by the time you do face those BC threats, you have a far better replacement. Worthy of an A tier, but it sits in B tier solid. And now the Jade Yin unit, the crossbows. These are your primary damage dealers. What those Jade Warrior swords won't cut through, just sheer weight of crossbow bolts will get you there. Okay, sure, these aren't the Dark Elf crossbow bolts that just fly through armor, but that's okay. You can increase this damage through the tech tree quite respectably. But most of all, like everything Cathay, they are dependable. Solid range, solid defense, covered in way more armor than a tier two archer has any right to be. Cathay and Discipline, they can dig in, increasing their armor even more. Just such a good basic unit. Reload speed will be increased by the harmony bonus because you will have those frontline holders in front. And later in your campaign, there is the shielded variant. If you see my formation videos, you know that I'm a fan of replacing the front ranks with shielded units because they're most likely to be hit and saving some money on shields on the back line. In many of the Cathayan campaigns, you won't find a lot of enemies that can outshoot you, so you'll find the shielded variant is more of a tool to counter a particular enemy. When facing Dark Elves, boy, this shuts them down with very few options. But while you're facing Greenskins, Skaven, other Cathayan factions, you can get away without having shields, save on the first couple of ranks. But Cathay get very, very rich, very, very quickly. Once money becomes no problem, just go for the shielded variant. Just keep an open mind to where that extra gold on those shields could go. The final Jade unit, their cavalry, the Jade Lancer. And this is just a mighty fine piece of cavalry. Good armor, decent charge, good enough stats, 
Unfortunately, it is outperformed by some of the other amazing options. Honestly, it's the perfect cavalry to complement a unit of Jade Warriors and Jade Crossbowmen, but you will find yourself not really needing them. If you have the chance to hire one for your army, go for it. Some things land in the B rank because they really struggle more than one tier above when they are hired, and at tier 5, these guys really will not cut it. Cathay have some great niche options which will better deliver for you. Still, cavalry is very useful for routing down the enemy, pushing the enemy off the map, and helping you hold your map advantage. So if you capture a stable, feel free to hire one and then demolish the stable for a market. Otherwise, I wouldn't really chase them. Before we move on with the video, I think it's important to explain why Jade Warriors are so much better now, and why I feel so comfortable calling a Peasants a C tier usable unit. There is just no reason now not to have a barracks in every single one of your provinces. In the long term, you do not want a barracks in any of your capitals, but you have several minor settlements to put them in. You'll want a market economy building and a growth building, which also increases the gold at every single minor settlement. But you'll have one slot left. If there's no unique resource building or no unique landmark, you'll have a free slot. So build yourself a barracks. Now, because at tier 3, you increase your cap of the new Gate Warden Hero, something you will absolutely want to do. Soon, once you have 10 of those, you can globally recruit any Jade unit in one turn. This strategy will give you a ton of Gate Masters, giving you a dynamic and flexible warrior, which does even more to reduce the cost of your Jade Warriors, bringing them closer to the cost of Peasants. This allows you to field hordes of armies that are incredibly strong for a fraction of the price they should be. Next we have our first actual S tier unit and that is Satang the Watcher and boy is this guy an absolute beast. A legendary terracotta sentinel with a bow can jump around and smash the map to pieces and on top of being an absolute literal giant behemoth on the battlefield off the battlefield, he is absolutely incredible. When you're not investing points in abilities and stats that make him even more of a menace on the battlefield, he makes Jade Warriors cheaper, more powerful. Constructs like Terracotta Sentinels, Jade Lions, even better, but honestly, the buffs to Jade units are just too good not to prioritize. Being a legendary hero, you're virtually guaranteed to get this guy. Seitang is far more than just a glorified sentinel. His giant bow essentially makes him an artillery piece able to do huge anti-large damage, which, let's face it, is always nice to have. And anything that does get close enough, he will evaporate with freaking lasers. On and off the battlefield, Seitang is an absolute must include, so how do you get him? Once you've completed your third province, sorry, gates don't count, you'll be prompted to rack up a few kills in battle, and then build five constructs across all your armies. Even if you don't use them, just build five jet or jade lions to get to the total you need. The next unit, the Onyx Crowman, a unit that's pretty cool. Think of it like the Dark Elf Harpy, but it's not crap. It's actually pretty good. Their bird vision can reach very far, uncovering hidden units. Extra speed and more than respectful melee defense means they can dive in and harass the crap out of archers. Yes, I know if you forget to babysit them, they will turn to stone and get smashed to bits, but microing these guys correctly in the right battles can be a huge difference maker. Allow their front lines to engage with yours, then flank these guys around into the back lines and cause absolute havoc. Shred their archers and then cycle charge into the front lines. Later in the campaign, you'll have to cycle charge more sparingly because they get outclassed. However, if you're facing an enemy fielding a lot of artillery, these are an excellent answer and will shred them very quickly. If you plan on fielding these guys without giving them much attention, they're not going to perform for you, but in the right circumstance, they can punch up very well and more than earn B tier solid. Next up, we have the Iron Hell Gunners, a bit of a Dark Horse fan favorite, and think of them as a diet blunderbuss of Chaos Dwarf fame. Short range, yes, but goddamn, they all fire three shots, and it is intense armor-piercing damage. It, this is most effective on either large creatures or heroes. Sniping down single entities is th what these guys are absolutely amazing at. Just don't keep them at the front of your formation if they have a ranged advantage on you, because they'll get targeted and sent to the back. So don't be afraid to keep them in reserve, and in the midst of battle, round them around a the flank, stretch them out, and watch them shred the armor off their elite infantry. Cathay widely get access to the Law of Metal, so Plague of Rust plus these guys will take down a Lord and strip them of their armor very quickly. Personally, I only bring two. Maybe you could bring four at most, but you really don't need to. They will struggle due to their range at higher tiers, but if you're under a siege or any short range map, boy will they deliver. 
Going from the Cathay and shotguns to the sniper rifle, we have the Crane Gunner. Essentially a two-man sniper rifle team of the classic duo of a spotter and a shooter. However, the spotter is balancing the gun on a shield which blocks 55% of incoming projectiles. You don't want these guys close though, they have a beastie range and the shield breaker ability. Only one bullet needs to land on the unit and you reduce their block chance by 24% for the next 10 seconds. The downside is they use up a lot of space and they do have 30 speed but they're overall not very mobile. They can clutter your formations and once the enemy is up close you'll find them less flexible than iron hail gunners. They have such a good range you'll want them deep, safely in your formation, targeting heavy armour and elite infantry. Having two or three is all you need so crossbows can fire over their heads. Needless to say, for either of these gunpowder units, if they run out of ammo, keep them safely down the back and away from trouble. Next up we have a unit that was certainly not legendary before, but thanks to the latest patch and the changes, they are legendary. We have the Astromancer hitting legendary thanks to a few changes, mainly in the name of his mount options, which has consistently been the weakness for the Cathayan heroes. In total, War Warhammer casters tend to be king because their mounts give them huge buffs to their physical abilities, helping them circumvent their melee shortcomings. The Astromancer already got the Wujing War Compass, which I'll address now. It essentially boosts spell mastery, i.e. the damage of the other spells on the map, as well as your wins regeneration, but this really honestly isn't that important. Your Lord will likely be a caster, you will have an Astromancer, an Alchemist, you have more than enough wins of magic to win most battles. The compass does come with four very powerful bound spells, and whilst this isn't enough for me to ever want to bring a compass, it makes a more than fine mount for the Astromancer. However, the best mounts for casters are fast, nimble mounts, and they now get the Moonbird, their other brand new unit from the latest expansion. The High Elf's number one beastie, the Arcane Phoenix, still does reign supreme, but the Moonbird definitely gives it a good run for its money. Certainly lacking the AP bite and character sniping potential, rocking insane speed to get around the map quickly, deliver those spells, and then cycle charge into the rear of enemies. The Moonbird also has three bound vortex spells, able to cast over the top of enemy blobs. If you didn't have a reason to have an Astromancer in every army before, you absolutely do now. The Law of Heavens is very powerful, great at debuffing, great at buffing, with some excellent air of the Effect. Every army needs an Astromancer and now they are S tier legendary, enjoy the Moonbird. You could hire the Moonbird by itself, but why bother when you can put an Astromancer on the top of it and save that slot for something else. There's a lot of good units in Cathay, if you can get them by mounting a hero on them, do it that way. Once any capital reaches tier 3, unless you have some really great buildings, you will want to prioritise the Celestial Tower. Increasing research rate is excellent thanks to the Cathayan technologies, which are typically quite great, as well as unlocking an Astromancer. This also means as soon as you hit tier 4, you can bump this up another level, further increasing your research rate and gifting you another amazing Astromancer. But there's actually very good reason to even get two Astromancers in some armies, one being on a bird, the other one on the compass. You can even use them as scouts, stealing research, bolstering your research percentage whilst leveling them up away from battle. As previously mentioned, Cathay don't have a lot of competition in their minor settlements which cap off at tier 3, so there are several provinces which contain minor settlements that allow you to build a tier 3 barracks. Having 10 of any building reduces the global upkeep speed by one turn, so you only need 10 barracks across your entire kingdom to globally recruit jade units in a single turn. But each one at tier 3 will also increase your cap of the new Gate Warden hero, and this guy is an absolute beast. Most of the time being a hybrid hero means you're okay at shooting and usually quite mid at fighting close combat. But the stats on this guy do not suggest that he's a bad fighter. He can get on a horse to get around quickly, plus he has a crossbow with excellent armor piercing making him a solid lord or single entity sniper. 50 melee defense, 95 armor and blocking 55% of all missiles his way, man this guy is solid. You can pump his melee defense up to 74 with skills and that's not even including armor. He has a ton of passive auras bolstering the melee stats, the reload skill and leadership of nearby units. This is only some of many of his great skills, but you cannot look past the Jade standard. Plus 6 melee defense is amazing, and dropping that upkeep makes your Jade Warriors even more affordable, and you have one of the most vicious cost-efficient armies in the entire game. 
The next hero is the Alchemist and it's in A tier and only just in A tier. God damn, it nearly still falls down to B. Metal magic is amazing, but being stuck on a horse when you're so, so squishy is not amazing at all. Now, don't get me wrong. Horses are great and nimble, able to dart in, casting spells and then dart back out. But Cathay needs good line holding heroes. Having a good mount would fix all of her problems. I'd be such a big fan of getting a Sky Lantern mount for the Alchemist. Yes, I know the Sky Lantern mount Mount sucks, but they're just kind of cool. But still, metal is a very versatile law, works very well with Cathay, but she manages to sneak up into A tier thanks to her metallurgy abilities, and they don't look like much on first glance. Essentially, increasing the damage by 25% on a single unit, but guess what? You're playing as Cathay. Your legendary lord is a freaking dragon. Send your legendary lord at theirs in dragon mode and then cast the metallurgy. Get the improved version which increases the armor piercing. I never bother with the others. The armor piercing buff is really good, works on virtually anything, and this ability keeps on replenishing. If your legendary lord is out of reach, then just cast it on the front line. And when you get in the habit of continually recasting it, you'll notice a difference, particularly on your legendary lord when it's sniping out enemy characters. But CA, please give her the Sky Lantern or even better, a Jade Longma as a mount. Alright, time to blow some stuff up. Let's talk about the Cathayan Artillery. Both are A tier, very, very good and very solid. You probably noticed the Cathayans are good at farming and that translates not just in terms of supply lines but also bringing their artillery around the battlefield. Their Grand Cannon is very very similar, almost identical to the Empire version. However, the Cathayan one is far more nimble, quick to position and in typical Cathay fashion deals fire damage as well. Against undead factions this will absolutely wreck them but keep in mind that Chaos Dwarfs love fire and this will do less to them. They benefit from Battlefield Harmony, so make sure you have a melee unit close enough to help them. They're easy to get, they're good, and they stay pretty damn good, just the same as Fire Rain Rockets. Again, it's very similar to the Empire counterpart, their Hellstorm rocket battery, but nowhere near the range and more rockets that do less armor piercing damage. It's still a very good A tier unit. A Cathayan army with between one and four artillery pieces is a happy Cathayan army. Just don't forget those melee units to protect you. Now a unit that greatly benefits artillery as well as range units is the War Drum. Honestly, it's a very unique unit that I often forget to build, but when I do see it in action, it always tends to impress me. Of course, you do not want more than one under any circumstance, although it does have two abilities. Needless to say, use the range capabilities and then once they get close, if you find the enemies really pressing in on you, switch songs to staying alive, which will increase the armor and hopefully hold out till the cavalry can get in. What is very easy to overlook is the ton of leadership and other bonuses this actually gives you. It bolsters yin and yang, so if you're finding your formations have too many range units and you can't spread your harmony wide enough, having a drum is a great way to flesh out the center of your formation, but this is a thematic and potent way to get that extra power in your army. Just remember this makes a complete and powerful formation function even better, it won't make a weak formation complete. Next we have the Jet and Jade Lion, probably the two most difficult and niche units in the entire roster. If you're not watching them closely, you will find them feeling either usable or even outperformed. They need intense micro to work very well, but if you understand their formations, they can grab a guy, roll around like a happy little kitty and beat the crap out of everyone around them. You just need to always have an exit strategy because they are big and when they're in between their animations, they get hit a lot. The biggest change is that all of the terracotta and jade style units are now constructs, meaning they don't flee, they just tend to literally turn to stone and fall over. Unfortunately, this means you can't turn your back on them at all, but the reason why they're in B tier is that they do answer a very, very good threat. If you're facing, say, a Skaven army, Greenskin army with a lot of heroes, these are an excellent candidate heroes. They're nimble enough to run around the enemy units and snipe the enemy down with some solid armor piercing damage. They each have a bound ability, the jet line can reflect enemy missiles, whilst there is a basic breath attack on the Jade variant. But remember, one is yin, the other is yang, so only one will get the melee benefit of the harmony bonus. A fun but novel use is having one of these follow your sky chunk around on the ground so it gets the battle harmony bonus. Having Satang in your army allows you to boost these guys a lot and there's a good number of research skills which bolster them to be quite formidable. The problem is, is there's a lot of other great research and skills that can be used in other places that have a much wider benefit. So, solid unit if you're a micro god, but... God damn, they're a lot of work 
another new unit, the Celestial Lion in A tier, excellent, and this thing is really, really great. It has a bit of a look and feel like a griffin, and that's honestly how it does operate. In many ways, this supersedes the other lions because it does what they do even better. One thing Cathay have a bit of trouble with is getting behind the enemy. They are a very slow, methodical, formation-based army. Having a Celestial Lion gives you a very fast-moving unit capable of getting behind, disrupting archers, and then charging into enemy units. Its specialty is terrorizing the crap out of whatever it dives into. It has insane speed that can be bolstered even more through research, fly around with impunity, terror routing, getting back in the air, flying away, and then doing it all over again. Its signature raw ability ignores if the enemy has immunity to psychology, as well as dumping their leadership. Personally, I always prefer to bring a Yin or Yang caster as my lord, they can fly no longer, but if you do want to mix it up, the Celestial General can mount one of these. Because you have the Celestial Tower everywhere, you have the grand aim of getting as many astromancers as possible. Ten of each building will reduce the global recruitment time by one. This allows you to recruit the Celestial Line as well as the Jade and Jet Line in a single turn. Being able to globally recruit a unit that maybe only has a niche use in a single turn certainly increases its value. Ugh, just when I thought my days of having things in ENF tier were done, we have the Sky Lantern and man, this is just a diet sky junk with not a lot else going on for it. Don't get me wrong, these things are cool. The Lord Magistrate Hero can take this as a mount. I would actually love the Alchemist to be able to take this as a mount. It would give it a purpose. But the Cathayan roster is absolutely stacked with so many unique options that solve a multitude of problems. And the Skyjank has all the firepower the Sky Lantern has, plus it can launch goddamn rockets. There is no point utilizing a slot for this unit, which is why I'm in favor of being able to bring it as a mount. Having lots of airships simply looks cool, but this is not worth the space in your army. When you're moving with this thing, rather than move in a straight line, try to arc each way because you will give each crane gunner, which has a long reload time, a chance to take a shot at the enemy. The only reason I'm saying this is the Skyjunk has the exact same crane gunners and can lever this exact same benefit because you should never ever hire this unit. The Skyjunk on the other hand I absolutely love and this is an S tier legendary unit and it is so iconic, so so good, it is artillery but you can fire from the air. You can get shots with this thing that you cannot get with any other piece of artillery in the game. Now yes it's only unleashing say a third of what your fire rain rockets would but it only really needs to. You can take whatever shots you want with impunity, especially with Miao Ying, they are absolutely devastating. I think carrying two in any army is both a lot of fun, especially if you take manual shot. I know you shouldn't do it, but goddamn it's fun and satisfying when you hit something. Whilst it does need to be stationary to unload the rockets, when it's moving away to reposition, all four of the crane gunners on board are taking shots at the enemy. Its missiles and speed can be increased through the technology, and if that's not enough, fly over the enemy and drop a freaking bomb on their head. S tier, legendary, just the way it should be. Next up, more iconic units, we have the legendary Celestial Dragon Guard, the creme de la creme, the most elite infantry in all of Grand Cathay. Warriors so disciplined, so well trained, and so successful, they have earned the right to be named and dubbed the Dragon Guard. First of all, the Halberdier version. Now you won't need tons of these, do not go around spamming them. Remember, these guys are a Yang unit, their job is to protect Yin units whilst giving them that protection. So they're part of a formation, not a barrage of orcs, just keep that in mind you only need at most five of these in your army and the rest of it use on gunpowder units, on flexible mobile units, on sky junks, on heroes, a terracotta sentinel. There are so many great tools in the Cathay roster. Have these to protect your range units. That is their job, not to deal damage, but to make anything that dares get close get torn to pieces. They carry a halberd and a shield so they can strike off a third of all arrows, have excellent armor, excellent stats bolstered even more by the harmony bonus, and anything that dares charge into them is not getting that charge bonus, they have extra charge defense, will reflect that damage, and that damage is massive because by the time you get them, you will have some of the increases to them from the tech tree. So great unit, S tier, one of the best defensive infantrymen in the entire game and they are protecting one of the best crossbowmen, best ranged missile infantry in the entire game. Arguably the unit that defines this faction, it is so freaking good. Made even better with the harmony bonus, there's not much more I can say about it. Really great armor piercing, 
bolstered with really great technology. Cathay have excellent gun powder units. These guys can just sit behind them. Anything that has survived the barrage of gunpowder, bullets, a backline of celestial crossbows is the perfect way to finish up your formation. Honestly, these two units are so good, you can basically make an entire army just out of them and they will do surprisingly well against most things. Consider having a couple of artillery behind them, maybe two, maybe three crane gunners in front of them. You can have three dragon halberds on the front and then a backline of celestial crossbows. Not much is going to be able to handle that, especially if you have some casters on some nimble mounts. Now sitting proudly in A tier excellent, the Terracotta Sentinel. An excellent, excellent big monster. You can spam them, but I really don't recommend it. However, they do work quite well with Cathay. Cathay are not a fast, nimble army. They are a slow moving formation. They move up in one giant block, which means this does not get left behind. The Terracotta Sentinel can fill a really great role. And if the enemy has a strong front line, this guy will literally walk straight over it. Personally, I like having one in my late game armies. I think they're a lot of fun. One or two is honestly all you need, but if you want to go crazy and build an army of them, do what you want. Whatever makes you happy. Personally, I find Grand Cathay makes such strong all comers armies that can handle any situation. There's no need to double down on one strength because they have strengths all around. And finally, the last unit, the Long Mariders. Celestial Dragon Guard. They basically feel like Pegasus Knights on steroids. They do very well. They're fast, nimble, very well armored, very defensive, quite tough for what they do. Flying Cavalry typically have the weakness that they can get caught in by the enemy and once their charge bonus wears off they tend to get beaten up if they get stuck in one place but the defensive stats on these are very very good. They are more than formidable. I only bring one or two in each army just to get that cycle charge because as previously mentioned getting behind the enemy is probably what Cathay are weakest at. Some of that really beastly chaos infantry that's beating up yours these guys swing in get the charge on them and turn the tides. They make an excellent mount for your characters and CA, please give the Alchemist a long mount. It would just really help round off this roster and they've done a great job at making this roster so round. And that's it for this video. Thanks so much for watching. Please consider giving the video a like, share, sub. It really helps out. If you'd like to see the Empire tier list, click here. And if you'd like to see the Meow Ying walkthrough, click here. 